All right, so we commence today's program. A very good evening to all the dear ladies and gentlemen here, and welcome to Talk of the Heart on the occasion of World Heart Day. With this, I'd like to firstly call upon stage and welcome Shri L. V. Prabhakar, Managing Director and CEO, Kendra Bank. <laughs> Along with our esteemed chief guest for today, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, Chairman of Narayana Rudyala Limited. And joining them would be Mr. Debashish Mukherjee, Executive Director, Kendra Bank. Along with K. Satyanarana Raju, Executive Director, Kendra Bank and Mr. Bridge Mohan Sharma, Executive Director, Canra Bank, onto the dais. It's an honor to have all of you gentlemen right here on the stage with us. With this also extending a warm welcome to Mr. Deepak Saluja, Director at, of Director South and East Times of India, who's joined us here with their audiences. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And also like to welcome the Chief General Manager, the General Managers, and all the dignitaries who have joined us here. And also especially extending a very warm welcome to all the staff, customers, and well-wishers who are connected online and are watching us on the web telecast. On World Heart Day, we are honored by the presence of the renowned cardiologist, Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, to talk about the relevance of heart health and how we can improve our everyday lives. I now request Shri L. V. Prabhakar to welcome the chief guest for today. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty, right here with us on the occasion of World Heart Day. Thank you, sir. All right, so World Heart Day is observed every year on the 29th September. And today is the opportunity for everyone to stop and consider the impact our daily activities have on our heart and how we can be more cautious about the decisions that we make every day. World Heart Day creates awareness for the people around the globe that cardiovascular diseases, including heart, including heart diseases and stroke, is the world's leading cause of death, claiming about 18.6 million lives each year. The number of people affected by cardiac diseases has doubled in India. Death rate due to cardiovascular diseases rose to 209.1 deaths per 1 lakh population in between 1990 and 2016. So this day aims to drive action to educate the people that by controlling the risk factors such as usage of tobacco, unhealthy diet and physical inactivity, at least 80% of premature deaths from heart diseases and stroke could be avoided. So World Heart Day is a global campaign during which individuals, families, communities as such as us and the government participate in activities to take charge of their heart health, not just of your own, but also the others around you. We and our members believe in a world where heart health is for everyone and is a fundamental human right and is a very crucial element of global health justice. Today's session especially is going to be a very informative one for especially all you bankers who may lead a life of stress and who may also lead a life of physical inactivity considering you're all on your chairs all day long. So especially for all of you, this session might be a very insightful one and uh, we're hoping that you all find the information on how you can manage your lifestyles better. With this, as you all know, we're joined here by Shri L.V. Prabhakar, the Managing Director and CEO who has taken Kendra Bank to new heights. And we can now proudly say that Kendra Bank is the third largest bank under his guidance. A huge round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. So with this, I request you to kindly use the podium and address the audience. Respected Dr. Devi Siti, sir, 
Sri Deepak Ji from Times Group, uh, my colleague executive directors and uh, ladies and gentlemen who are present here and also who are watching through online. Uh, really, it is a privilege for Kendra Bank for all of us, sir, you accepting our invitation and uh, being a part of this function today at this corporate office. Uh, sir, Kendra Bank, we have about 87,000 employees today who are very interested to hear you. And we have about uh, 10 crore customers. Most of them will be hearing and will be passing on the message to them and will be uploading on our website also so that it will be in the interest of them to go through whatever you are going to say today to them. And uh, sir, in Kendra Bank, we always give importance to work-life balance. So we do good business, as she has said. We have progressed a lot and now uh, generally, dil bada hona chahiye. our balance sheet is also big. <laughs> our balance sheet is 19 trillion balance sheet. And uh, we make about uh, 23,000 crores of operating profit and a net profit of about uh, roughly 10,000 crores moving forward. So, sir, with these few words, my people are very eager to hear you. Again, thanks a lot, sir, for coming and being a part of us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your insightful words, sir. I would now like to introduce to all of you our honorable chief guest for today, a cardiac surgeon of high repute and a successful entrepreneur. Dr. Devi Prasad Shetty is highly respected a luminary for his ingenious ideas for reform in the healthcare sector. His visionary leadership to make quality healthcare affordable for all has drawn global recognition. Narayana Rudyala, as you all know, has been an interesting case study for the likes of Harvard Business School and the Wall Street Journal. In association with the government of Karnataka, Dr. Shetty pioneered Yashaswini, a very, an inexpensive micro-health insurance scheme benefiting more than 3.4 million rural population. Dr. Shetty is the current chairman, Board of Governors, Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, and he's also, he has also served as the member, Board of Governors of Medical Council of India and representative of President of India in the Board of Governors of Indira Gandhi National Open University. A strong advocate of technology for efficient healthcare delivery, Dr. Shetty takes deep interest in creating and developing software products for the application to achieve time and cost efficiency while minimizing clinical errors in the healthcare delivery. Dr. Shetty has also now over 47 healthcare facilities with over 7,000 beds. Let's once again put our hands together to invite Dr. Devi Shetty onto the podium right here and we request our chief guest to kindly address the audience. Good evening. I'm extremely grateful to the Kendra Bank for giving me this opportunity to interact with you on this very important day of World Heart Day. I am not going to give a long, boring speech. Instead, I would rather interact with you. But let me start off with a brief introduction about my very purpose of being here. Last few years, very often we uh, hear about a famous actor with six packs and big muscles, a young man who is like an epitome of health or fitness, suddenly collapses and dies. Or a famous singer, during his performance, he collapses and dies. And every other day we hear of young, fit people who are running on a treadmill in a gym, they collapse and die. And the message we get is, he had a sudden heart attack. Unfortunately, all these deaths could have been predicted 10 years ahead. Today, we have the technology to predict the very early stage of the heart disease 
and if the person doesn't take necessary action we know that he or she will de definitely land in trouble and possibly a heart attack and a pos small possibility of death if all these people had a ct scan of the heart called ct angio or a ct scan almost all these deaths could have been predicted 10 years earlier we indians especially and most of the uh, non indians as well we equate about how fit we feel to how healthy we are unfortunately the body doesn't believe in this concept you may feel that i'm the fittest person if you stand in front of me and you may say that look i climbed mount everest three times in the last one month and i'm standing at get me on ecg get an echocardiogram and a ct scan of your heart once i see those reports i will tell you whether you are a fit person or not how you feel what you do how many miles you can run non stop that doesn't mean anything because 50% of the people who develop heart attack 50% of the patients we operate they have no symptoms they felt before the episode that they are perfectly healthy people and the only message i want to give you is that i know most of you by the grace of god are feeling fit and you feel i have nothing wrong and these two are two different entities it is very very important that everyone pass the age of 35 40 and people who embark on extreme exercises these days youngsters love to do all these extreme exercises where they push their heart rate to 150 160 they have to get a ct scan of the heart and all the tests i have men mentioned it is mandatory in most the armed forces especially in us they mandate that they go through all these rigorous tests just to make sure that the person is fit the the whole philosophy of our approach towards healthcare must change we always feel that we should see the doctor when we have a problem but the message we want to give you is see the doctors when you don't need to see them so that you may never have to see them because every disease known to mankind if it is diagnosed at a early stage i may not say every disease most diseases if they are diagnosed at a early stage we can cure them if we cannot cure them but at least we can give them a meaningful life to celebrate the 60th or a 70th birthday it is possible the technology exists today what healthcare can offer is nothing short of magic some of the outcomes of healthcare intervention is nothing short of magic i'll give you a story around 14 years ago a 45 or a 50 year old banker came to us with completely damaged heart and we advised him to undergo heart transplant and he was very clear that children are young and he just didn't want to take a chance so we implanted a artificial heart called elvad lvad and he lived with that for 12 years his children grew up and they finished their graduation they found a job every family members were settled then his elvad was 
giving problem and that was a time to change or switch over to transplant. At that time, he agreed to undergo a transplant. Today we do heart and lung transplant on 70 year olds. It was unthinkable just five, 10 years ago. So essentially, we have wonderful uh, options in healthcare. But all those options work the best if you happen to see the doctors on time. So this is the message I want to give you and I'm very happy to answer all your questions. Thank you. Can I have the mic? Good afternoon, sir. Good Doctor, uh, I have, a, as you said, one uh, clarification I would like to have because I have got a cholesterol problem that for which I am taking medicine for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, when I go, you should not do this. So just I would like to have your suggestion for this. They did not do this, although I was agreeable to do that. Yes, I am. Thank you, sir. See, the, there is a general tendency if somebody uh, they had a a rough time at work, didn't sleep for three days, they check their blood pressure, and blood pressure is invariably high, the first thing we do is to prescribe medicine. When you find the blood test report with shows slightly abnormal lipid profile, the tendency is to prescribe medicines to uh, control their lipid profile. It's very interesting how the uh, medical science changes their perception for certain diseases. As a surgeon uh, working in different parts of the world, I can say I can produce few thousand angiograms of patients who had normal coronary arteries, no blockages, with grossly abnormal lipid profile, and people who had uh, uh, normal lipid profile with very extensive blockages. Then where do we go? So the, today, generally what we recommend is that if a 35-year-old person comes to us with the abnormal lipid profile, not grossly abnormal, but slightly abnormal, before we start the treatment, we should try to ask them to change the diet and do all those options. Then, if it is still persistent, document the, uh, the, the carotid arteries and the coronary angio, the CT angio, to find out whether there are any early disease. If there is no disease, if there is no coronary arteries are normal, what is the point in uh, uh, giving this medicine, which you have to take it lifelong? These are after all chemicals, and there is no medicine in the world without side effects. So there are, I can produce large number of literature now, coming from the Western world, showing that rigorous changes in the, uh, the manipulation of the lipid profile with the medicines may not have that kind of impact in the ultimate outcome. So the, it's very interesting <laughs> about the uh, uh, exposure of radiation in CT angio. Earlier version of the machines, it was high. But the newer version, which is very high fast CT scanner, it has come down significantly. But you get to do the CT angio maybe once in your lifetime. You may not have to repeat it again. Okay? So uh, I understand the apprehensions, but we need to be very practical in our approach. 
past the age of 40, 45, virtually everyone in this world are living under the fear of when is my turn to get the heart attack. Anything happening in the chest, some indigestion, some problem, they feel that, you know, maybe I am getting heart attack. And generally, they are on all kinds of medications, so much of stress. Why go through this? So, at the age of 45, 50, I think it's safe for you to go for a CT scan in an advanced CT scanning machine. And even if you have 5% blockage, then we know that if you don't take measures, it will progress. Coronary artery disease is a progressive disease. It progresses. So the, uh, I understand the uh, hesitation. The medical science is scared of uh, radiation with our bitter experience of history of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today, medical science has gone too far ahead of using technologies to, uh, you know, the, the address these issues. Thank you, sir. So actually, I have heard you speaking on TV several times. And now that uh, you are before me, so I can ask a very simple question, which sometimes bother us as human being. So what sort of lifestyle changes one should effect in day-to-day -day life? And uh, I, I am sometimes I am reading that you take garlic in the morning or sometimes this. So whether this garlic sort of thing is right to take in the morning for BP control and all, and whether this is effective in the long run. See the. Uh I, I am not, I wouldn't be able to talk much about the garlic. Uh, the, uh, I know lifestyle modification has a big impact on the course of the disease. There is no doubt about it. And uh, simple thing which are obvious, let me just explain to you. Overweight, right? If you are, say, 110 kilos. Now, human heart is designed to manage about generally for an Indian 70, 80, 90 kilos. And uh, if you load it with more higher body weight, uh, its expectation load on the heart will increase. And as the load increases, it will definitely affect the performance. And we notice that uh, weight reduction especially in patients with weak heart, significantly helps them. And uh, diabetes control has a huge impact on the progression of the uh, coronary artery disease. So simple thing like maintaining the body weight at the optimum level, whatever is possible. Regular exercise, I'm not talking about running on a treadmill. We have a, I strongly recommend that, uh, suggest that people past the age of 50, 60 shouldn't be jogging for a long distance because it hurts their joints. Uh, and there is nothing to suggest that jogging is better than a brisk walk because brisk walk is definitely sustained longer period of time. But I'm a very, very strong advocate of yoga. I have no doubt that yoga is one of the best gifts India has given to the world. I will tell you, <laughs> I'll tell you my personal experience. As a young medical student, I was, I spent more time in the gym rather than in the, <laughs> in the classroom. So I was a uh, exercise, uh, Freak. I always wanted to exercise and I ho hold all these belts, the brown belt in karate and all kinds of... Uh, and I thought I I'm a very, very fit person. I think about maybe uh, seven or ten years ago, I started getting pain in my knees. And we stand for eight hours, ten hours continuously and... Knee pain is fairly common, back pain and neck pain is common for us. It just comes and goes. 
and uh, I ignored it initially, but it didn't go. Normally these pains come and go. And it went on like that for months. Then my wife started warning me that, why don't you start yoga? And I said, look, that's not for me. Uh, I'm a bodybuilder and I, I, I'm very happy with my exercise regime. But it became unbearable. I couldn't, uh, you know, I became conscious of when I'm climbing steps, which foot to put forward to protect that uh, knee. Uh, in the end, I agreed to uh, get a yoga teacher and, you know, it's, I don't think it's more than a month or a few weeks. The pain completely disappeared. And today, if you ask me, which was the knee which hurt you for more than six, eight months, I can't even recollect. It was pure magical. Then I started reading, what, what is the difference in yoga exercises compared to bodybuilding exercise. Because I spend a lot of time in bodybuilding and I understand the human anatomy, bodybuilding essentially trains the flexors because that's the one uh, which shows your muscles which are flexors, so it shows off. But yoga concentrates on the flexibility of all the joints and a lot of the yoga exercises are bending forward and bending backward. So essentially, it moves the joints to the fullest extent. Possibly, it helps by uh, reducing the rigidity. As we grow older, our tendons become more rigid. When we are young, tendons are very elastic. As we grow older, it becomes, maybe it is extending and making it more accommodate. So I have, I would recommend my, I have, even my children who are into bodybuilding, I have always told them that fine, bodybuilding is good, but start, a, start yoga along. I recommend everyone, especially people past the age of 50, at least for 15 minutes, at least on alternative days, you must practice yoga. Because aches and pains are part of our life as we grow older, and the best solution is yoga. I have no doubt about it. If I may ask you one question. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, you know, a person staying alone suddenly feels uncomfortable in the early hours of the morning. No history of any heart problem or anything. What do you suggest? You know, panic sets in. People, you know, feel very uncomfortable. You know, something very drastic is going to happen. No feeling sets in, and nobody is there except, of course, mobile is there. Uh, other than that, what is your first? Uh, I mean, what is your suggestion that person should do? You see, when you have the slightest doubt whether it is the heart attack or the indigestion due to fish you ate the previous night. My recommendation to everyone is anything happening above your waist, unusual symptoms, which is, uh, you know what are the different types of aches and pains you get in your body. Something unusual, especially late at night, please go to the hospital. Do not assume it is a hyperacidity. Do not assume that uh, it is a gas. I can, why it is important for you to go to the hospital is, there is six hours of time called golden period of heart attack. If you happen to develop a blockage in one of the arteries, that threatens that particular area of the heart muscle. And in six hours, if we can open the artery and uh, reestablish the circulation, you can save your heart muscle. After six hours, you can do whatever you want. You cannot salvage that heart muscle. And once it is dead, heart muscle injury is permanent. It cannot be reversed. And most of the deaths following heart attack happens in the first few hours. So, 
Today, city like Bangalore is blessed in having so many hospitals, good hospitals all over the place, where they have a decent infrastructure to diagnose the heart attack and uh, treat it. And most of the heart attacks can be reversed if you reach the hospital on time. And the result can be dramatic, can be dramatic. Uh, good evening, Doctor. I had actually two questions. One question I've already replied. That was, uh, is there a concept called fit and fat? I think that <laughs> that is not there. So the second question is, uh, the oil is a very important ingredient in our uh, cuisine. And there are advertisements which talk about olive oil and uh, different types of oil. Uh, what would be your suggestion that, uh, that should be used in the... Uh, it's, it's very interesting. You know, as one spends longer time in this profession, you see something becoming very popular, becoming unpopular. When I was a young medical student, everything happening in human body is blamed on coconut oil. Today, Americans and Europeans, Indians think that coconut oil is the best gift given by the God. And you may not believe, today Americans are drinking coconut oil, thinking that that will prevent Alzheimer's disease. So, in my experience, all oils are good or bad. So, better to restrict the quantity. See, God wanted all of us to have oil. So, he gave us the nuts in which there is oil. But he gave us a lopsided brain and we started squeezing the nuts and extracting the oil and started eating it. Same thing we did with sugar. God gave us all the fruits for the sugar. God gave us sugar cane for the sugar. But we took the extract and the concentrate we started. Uh, so most of the problems we face is because we went against the nature's law. Whatever it is, we, today we can't eat without oil. So whatever oil you take, it's okay, but limit it. Yeah. Uh, sir, Namaskar. Sir, dil ki baate dil hi jane. So, I mean, today you are here. We are privileged to have you here, sir. So, thank you so much. My three questions, sir. I have three questions. First one is, what is your definition of a beautiful heart? That is one. <laughs> Number two is, we, majority of us, maybe most of us, are diabetic. So that is one good thing diabetes has taught us that, be active, remain agile, so uh, to fight out. So it has got good effects also in other way. But how it is linked to heart disease? And third question is, is it genetic? Thank you, sir. Coronary artery disease is uh, genetic. It runs in families. Uh, the, uh, your other question, uh, the one is about genetic and what is the other question you... Sir, what is the definition of beautiful oh, heart? Okay, well? right. No, I, I wouldn't say beautiful, but uh, in the operating room we always use a term called happy heart. Happy heart is when the chest is open, surgery has been done, Heart is comfortably beating, not struggling. When we look at it, irrespective of what the cardiac monitor says, we look at the heart and say, oh, it's a happy heart, don't worry. Right? It all depends on the uh, uh, way the uh, heart functions. You see, it's very interesting. We give so much of importance to the heart uh, as the area of emotion, and as the organ which represents love, affection. But all these things, what I'm talking about, these emotions, it has nothing to do with the heart. It is all done by the brain. Heart is just a dumb pump, which you put in five liters, it will pump out five liters. And it is the easiest organ 
to replace. I can tell you that in the next, maybe within four years time, when the heart is badly damaged, uh, when the total heart is damaged, instead of going for a heart transplant, there will be artificial hearts which will replace them. Today we are replacing the left half of the heart, not the total heart. But it's a matter of time before, because as I said, brain has lot of intelligent function. You cannot reproduce it. Even kidney has lot of very delicate function. It is difficult uh, to implant it. Of course, dialysis does the, machi the dialysis machine does the job. But implanting is difficult. But heart, it just requires a power. You put in a motor and a wire comes out and a battery, it works. So the, uh, uh, the emotional angle to the heart is not really uh, that great. But I'm happy that you are giving all the importance to the organ I love. <laughs> Have I answered your questions? Sir, third one is how heart disease is linked to diabetes? Yes. There is no doubt about a strong relationship between diabetes and the heart disease. But the good thing is, if the diabetes is well controlled, then you can virtually negate all the complications attached to the diabetes affecting the heart. So that is the uh, good news. And about management of the diabetes, now a lot of uh, new thinking is happening. Like when uh, we, uh, maybe about 10, 20 years ago, everyone blamed fatty food and oil for all the bad things happening in the body. Today, the thinking is dramatically different. Today's thinking is everything is uh, blamed on the carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, you know, rice and chapatis and lot of thinking goes in the way saying that carbohydrates are the ones which are d depositing sugar and sugar is responsible for all the bad things happening in the body. So all of a sudden the blame has been shifted from the oil and fatty food to carbohydrates. Yeah. Thank you sir. Thank you. Yeah please please please. Actually, I lost one of my close friends at his age of 32, so 20 years back. He was in a PhD doctorate in uh, Ames. He suffered with a pulmonary hypertension. Those days, there was no treatment for transplantation of both heart and the lungs. And he lost his brother when he was uh, 16 years with the same disease. Of course, his life was extended with, uh, by using a Viagra for one and a half year and two years. But presently, whether that a treatment has come into the existence, sir, or still that it's a once in a crore, they say that those days the people used to say that. There are two types of pulmonary hypertension. One is PPH, that is primary pulmonary hypertension. That's not very common among men. And uh, it's, it's, it's not a very uncommon disease, but fairly common. But the common disease across now is called pulmonary embolism resulting in high pulmonary artery pressure. Generally what happens, people develop clot in the legs and the clot gradually moves up and it enters the heart and eventually lands in the lung arteries and blocks the uh, lung arteries. That results in high uh, lung pressure and they are not able to walk and uh, about, I think, around 20 years ago, only few centers in US were doing the uh, surgeries on these patients. Uh, I think 15, 16 years ago, we started doing the surgeries. We have done close to 700 surgeries on patients with very high pulmonary artery pressure. Again, the result is very dramatic. People who were on oxygen at home, after the surgery, there are 
youngsters who are on oxygen at home, today they are scuba diving. Yeah. That's why when I say that healthcare has you know, real change. magical uh, transformation on human body, thanks to the technology, better understanding of the problem, and the, the wonderful drugs, and outstanding doctors, excellent care, all these have contributed to amazing uh, revolution in healthcare. Yeah. So celebrating 100th birthday is going to be a norm. But the choice is up to you to decide whether you want to celebrate the 100th birthday sitting on a wheelchair or standing upright. That depends on the investment what you make now. Uh, normal, uh, the, generally the, the common symptoms uh, for a heart disease, how do you identify that? So that's the one of the first question which I have. General common symptoms, we have hearing so many symptomatic, uh, uh, the people suggest in various uh, media or even the other reasons, but what are the main common symptoms? And there is one general conception about the hypertension which is almost linked to the heart disease, this is one of the... So there is really a, a various, uh, the confusion version with regard to hypertension. So I would like to answer what exactly the hypertension means. Are there an optimum level of uh, the blood pressure to be maintained in the common course of uh, our daily life? Sure. Uh, first thing is the symptoms of heart disease. Generally, on exertion, when you are walking fast, climbing steps, if you start getting breathing difficulty or a tightness across the chest. Uh, this is generally an indication that something is going wrong. That should alarm everyone. Any unusual symptoms which you are not used to, above the waistline if it happens, it's always better to consult the doctor and get the investigation done. Uh, of course, a lot of the patients, heart attack is the way they come to know that uh, they have a problem. And most of the patients we treat, they would have gone to see a doctor for a cataract surgery or a gallbladder surgery or a hip replacement or some process, procedure. And the anesthetist will insist that cardiac checkup has to be done. And at that time, most of the problems get diagnosed. Now, about the hypertension, Hypertension generally is related to the stress involved in our day-to-day -day life. So my advice for as long as the blood pressure is not extremely high, my advice is to try to change the lifestyle first. You may take some small dose of medicine, but you should tell yourself that within six months, I want to come out of the medicine. Now, how do I come out of the medicine? One is people who are slightly overweight, if they lose weight, that helps. Regular exercise will help. And a regulated lifestyle, in the sense, we all have a biological clock. And the biological clock is designed to get you hungry at 7 o'clock in the morning. That's the time you have breakfast. Again, you get hungry at 1 o'clock, again at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, dinner time. But having breakfast one day at 7 o'clock, next day at 11 o'clock, dinner at uh, 12 o'clock at night, all these things upsets your body uh, mechanism. So if you can regulate everything, all your routine in terms of breakfast, lunch, and dinner at the same time, going to bed at the same time, a lot of things can make a huge difference. Uh, in controlling the blood pressure. One of the mistake most of the hypertensive do, today for 2,000 rupees you can get a BP operator, so you don't need a doctor to tell you what the BP is. Now, if you're going to check your blood pressure at home, first you have to identify a chair and a table, and that is the only chair and table you will use all the time. Because change in the posture will have some impact on the, uh, change in the position itself can change the blood pressure. That's one thing. 
then most important advice is before you check the blood pressure, sit on the chair and just relax for 20 minutes. Don't run around the house and do all kinds of things. Just sit and put the BP operators. It will invariably high. So 20 minutes and check it at regularly at the same time. Because you're not looking at one reading. You're looking at continuous reading after you know long time to come. So at the same time, that will give you an idea about what the blood pressure is. And you will be able to tweak the medicine based on that. But every hypertensive should make a commitment that I would like to come off the medicine. Every diabetic should make a commitment that I want to come out of the medicine by diet restriction. That should be the aim. You may not achieve it, but as long as the aim is there, one day or other you will achieve. Yes. Respected sir. Really, we have to thank our management to see you face to face. Sir, uh, yesterday also one of our colleagues collapsed uh, and uh, for every death uh, normally people say heart attack. So in the working environment or workplace or in the uh, house, if anybody collapses, what we should as a layman, uh, resurrection or artificial respiration through mouth to mouth, uh, anything like do you advise or is it feasible? If yes, how we have to do one. Second thing, in your first reply itself, you were mentioning diet. You touched upon it. And in your uh, one of the interviews, no oil is good for the art like that you mentioned. Yes. To what extent we have to restrict the oil or what dietary modification or uh, regulation we have to practice? I thank you for answering these two questions. Thanks, thank you, sir. thanks. The uh, coming to the, um, you know, somebody, if they collapse at the workplace, first thing is you try to shift that person at the earliest to the nearest hospital. And during that time, if the person is not breathing or is deeply unconscious, you should be able to feel the pulse you should be able to see whether he's breathing or not. If the pulse is uh, not there, and if the person is not breathing, then obviously you have to uh, uh, compress the chest to uh, uh, support the circulation. But if you haven't been trained, I would strongly recommend not to get into that. Because you can hurt the person, because you don't know how much force you need to use. It's not e difficult to fracture the ribs. So the, my recommendation is that every, play, every workplace where there are a large number of people, there should be, it, is, it isn't difficult. You have to watch few videos. You can learn. People should be uh, taught about the uh, resuscitation, basic things about resuscitation. And it is a matter of time before it will become legally mandatory for every workplace to have a defibrillator. And these days, defibrillators are very, very uh, good in terms of identifying the problem, then only shocking. So that kind of a machines are available. It's a matter of time. About the oil, as I said, we should assume that all oils are bad. And you're used to taking one particular oil. At the age of 45 or 50, somebody says that coconut oil is not good, you have to use for some other oil. It's very difficult for you to adapt to those oils. So essentially, try to restrict it as much as possible. Yeah. Sir. Hello, sir. Uh, sir, I have four questions. Um, the first one is, how important is scientific awareness about human anatomy, irrespective of their job profile? Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, say it again. How important is scientific awareness about the human anatomy and its functions, irrespective of the job profile, to avoid the major issues of the health? And uh, nowadays we are having all kind of communications expressing about different kind of health issues and different kind of treatments, but we are not sure which one is the genuine uh, method or uh, remedy for that. 
So each one has their own kind of remedies and each one has their own uh, perspective about uh, disease or uh, situation. So in that kind of situations, like if anything happens to a person in the workplace or in home, it will be a chaos because each one is having a different perspective. So where we, where we can get a genuine awareness about what is happening inside the body, the basic functions at least. So how important is it than the job or whatever it is in the world? So please guide us upon that. Sure. That is my first question. Yeah, the, I, I strongly feel that, you see, we try to know so much about different things in this world. We have so much of knowledge about politics happening in Ukraine. We have so much hap knowledge about what happens in different countries' conflicts. But we have very little understanding about what is happening in our own body and how the heart functions, how the lung functions, how the stomach functions. I agree there aren't very good quality uh, teaching material, but there are quite a lot of teaching material available in uh, YouTube and uh, various uh, other uh, social media uh, uh, applications. I just want to let you know that at this stage of mine, when somebody, a senior respected surgeon, puts up his uh, video on a particular operation, I watch it and I learn new things, right? So there are a lot of nonsense things are there in the uh, social media, but there are a lot of good things are also there. And I think, you know, big organizations like yours should compile with the help of doctors, what are the videos which is useful for all your colleagues' uh, healthcare, you know, well-being? It should be compiled and it should be authenticated by doctors. Then that should be circulated. That is the best way to educate people. Today, to get the education, you don't need to go to a medical school. There are enough materials available. Yeah. But uh, we won't be confident enough to suggest anyone because there is a, means we don't, we know about a thing like seeing in a YouTube or seeing in some social media, we get the information, but we won't be confident enough to tell them to do that or tell not to do that because we are not certified. So in that way, how can we help each other in those things? Uh, I just uh, wanted to uh, clarify on that. Sure. Let me use my, uh, uh, let me think about it and we uh, get back to you, yeah. Oh, sir, sir. sir uh, one more thing, sorry. Sir, uh, this is the common thing what happens. We hesitate to take tablets even if the name is different, but the molecule name is the same. So, can you please suggest upon that? Because the same medicine, if the name changes, we won't buy it. And we go in search for that even if it is delayed or whatever it is because of the lack of knowledge or lack of awareness about that. So please guide us on that. Generally, it is safer to stick to the doctor's prescription, whatever they have prescribed, because there are so many companies making medicines. So doctor obviously has some knowledge about the quality. It is not what is written in the capsule cover. It is what is inside. So it is better you stick to it, but People, uh, if there are very, very good generic drugs alternatives available, that can be changed. It's not, it's not that they cannot be changed, but somebody has to say that it's a good medicine to take. Yeah. Sir, good evening, sir. Thanks. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, there are two questions. Sir, yes. if uh, we are taking for any medicine for hypertension for three or four or five years, and if we do not feel any side effects, do we need to change, require to change the medicine? This is the first question, sir. And second question, if any person is having a normal blood pressure in the normal range, but his heart rate is more, uh, about 95 to 100 always, so what sort of uh, test he should go for? As I said, there are few standard tests one has to undergo to understand what exactly is uh, happening in the heart. It doesn't matter what problem you have. You feel there is something wrong with the heart or 
heart rate is high or low, get all those tests done and the doctors will be able to guide you. If a particular medicine suits your body, just continue with it. No problem. You have, you have, set an, you have tested yourself on that medicine and that suits you. Please take it. Don't change it. We also have a couple of questions from our online viewers who have joined us on the webcast. Sure. Uh, two questions together I would like to ask you on their behalf. Uh, what are the first aid steps that can be taken during a heart attack? And what is the difference between the pain caused during a heart attack and caused by gastric trouble? Yes. The, uh, uh, as I said, it is uh, impossible uh, to uh, differentiate uh, the uh, pain uh, without really doing all the investigations. So my advice to everyone, if you get unusual chest pain, please assume it is from the heart until proven otherwise. And most of the time, it is not from the heart. But at least you have investigated and found out it is from the heart. Because if it is from the heart, it is the best time to take the treatment and initiate the whole treatment process. Yeah. And the first eight steps during a heart attack, what could one do to... First thing is to reach the nearest hospital. That should be the first attempt. Then if you have aspirin and the sorbit rate and those tablets, a lot of people do have it. They can take those tablets, but that should be done with some kind of a medical knowledge because suddenly giving sorbit rate can bring down the blood pressure and have problems. So my recommendation is not to try any of those. Try to reach them to the hospital at the earliest. Yes. Yeah. And one last question from another online viewer. Uh, will consuming more coffee or tea lead to heart attacks? <laughs> the, I, I, I am, once again, I'm not an expert in advising on what, uh, uh, what is good for the heart. I am not sure whether any of those are bad for the heart, but the, some of those coffee tea, sometimes it can increase the heart rate, but that's of no consequence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, please. This would be the last question from the audience before we proceed with today's program. Sir, I got angioplastic in February 2020. And still my heart is working only 40%. My doctor told me after the angioplastic, your heart will work only 40 to 45%. Even for a healthy person, it will work only 60 to 65%. What is the truth? Yes. See, the uh, yeah, normal heart uh, pumps efficiency is about 55 to 60 percent. You perhaps had a little bit of an injury to the heart, so because of the injury, your pumping action came down. But with 45 percent ejection fraction, you can do everything what a 65 percent ejection fraction can do. Yeah, it's not a problem, but you have to make sure that it doesn't become 25 percent. Yeah. like to thank you for your time and for uh, your presence right here. And I'm sure that your insights will definitely help our lives for years to come. Uh, with this, I would like to request Mr. Debrishish Mukherjee to felicitate our honorable chief guest with a book. A huge round of applause once again <laughs> for having us with us here, Dr. Devi Shetty. I now request Mr. Satyanarana Raju to give a divinity gift to our esteemed chief guest right here.
Thank you very much, sir. I would now like to request Mr. Bridge Mohan Sharma to hand over the divinity gift to Mr. Deepak Saluja, Director, South and East from Times of India. A huge round of applause for Mr. Deepak Saluja. Thank you very much, sir. I request the audience to kindly take back their seats. We now proceed to the vote of thanks, for which I request Mr. R. P. Jaiswal, General Manager, Retail Assets, Marketing and Public Relations Wing, Canara Bank, Head Office, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks and join us right here on the podium. Thank you, sir. With this, we come to the end, end of this evening, sir. And uh, we hope that uh, it was an enlightening and rich with a lot of information to all of us. With uh, this, I think, a big round of applause to Dr. <laughs> Devi Shetty ji. We firmly believe that the audience are now better prepared to lead a healthier and more fulfilled life. And with this, work with more enthusiasm and dedication, without any fear. It has been a huge privilege to host Dr. Devi Shetty, sir, on behalf of entire CanBank family and all our customers and well-wishers, those who are watching you live through YouTube and Facebook. We Thank you very much on behalf of entire Canada Bank family. We thank you our respected MD and CEO, Sri L.V. Prabhakar, sir, uh, who is always enthusiastic and uh, most powerful guiding force for all Canaraites. And uh, that was the idea and uh, with his guidance and uh, his uh, vision we could fulfill uh, and have Dr. Sethi among us. Uh, big round of applause to our <laughs> respected MD and CEO sir. Thank you very much sir for this wonderful evening uh, with uh, filled with all information and uh, uh, rich tradition. We go back to our own respective lives and remember the words of Dr. Shetty that we believe and uh, hope. Uh, we thank you on behalf of uh, all of us gathered here and uh, all our online viewers, our uh, respected uh, executive directors, Sri Devasis Bukharji ji, those are Talia, <laughs> Sri K. Satranayan Raju ji, Sri Brij Mohan Sharma ji. We also thanks uh, Mr. Satish Saluja ji, and his entire team from Times of India. They are with us, with this program. And uh, we thank you all our chief general managers, general managers, all Canarites, offline or online, all our customers, well-wishers, those who are connected to this program through our Union Health Ministry, those who are connected to this program through our uh, Narayana Hospital link, and uh, those who are connected through Times of India link. So thank you very much to all of you, and we hope uh, to see you again in another wonderful program under the guidance and vision of uh, our visionary leader, Sri L.V. Prabhakar, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, all. Can you just give me two minutes? I could see most of the people are sad and depressed after my talk. <laughs> I just want to give you an interesting message. That is, you heard me talking about how to take care of the heart. You have to do this, no fat, no carbohydrate, exercise, lose weight, all kinds of things. A lot of you in your life 
have seen people who did everything other than what I have just asked you. And they smoked like chimney, drank like a fish, and they are fit at the age of 95. And people who led a very regulated life, what I am talking about, they get heart attack, diabetes, all kinds of... Now, why this happens? Right? I, I just want to... It may not be very accurate in terms of percentage. Like, look at the heart attack, heart disease. Let's assume there are 100, the 100 people. About 25% of the people in the world, I, as I said, it's not a very accurate percentage. They are born in families where no male member has celebrated 50th birthday. These are the people, they can live on top of the Mount Everest with all the healthy diet and doing, leading the life of a monk. Still, they develop heart attack. They have a very strong genetic predisposition. There is another 25% of the people who will do everything what they are not supposed to do. As I said, they drink like a fish, smoke like a chimney, and the only way they will die is you have to shoot them down. <laughs> Otherwise, nothing will happen to them. But 50% of the people in the world are the fence-sitters. If they lead a very regulated life and every, you know, do everything right, instead of them developing heart attack at the age of 45, they may develop it at 65, 70. Right? Or they may never develop the heart attack. So, nobody knows which category we all belong to. <laughs> so, my advice for all of you, is that you assume you are the fence-sitter, do everything, in the end nothing is lost. Of course you would have lost uh, enjoying your life, but, uh, but then all of you will celebrate past the age of 65, 70, when, you know, with the, uh, all the good things what is happening in life, you will be able to celebrate. So no regrets in life, so don't feel sad, cheer up, thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much to all you gentlemen for being right here with us on the stage. I would now request the dignitaries and the audience to kindly head outside for the high tea and also joining and also thanking all of you for joining us and making this event a great success. Remember to stay fit and to have a healthy heart together